Martin Yosifowski. Uh, he's a student at EPFL, and he's actually a student, a joint student between uh, Robert West, who was the uh, first speaker today, and Martin Yagi, who is sitting here, and he is a co-organizer of his meetups. Hello, everyone. I'm Martin, as Pavel already said. Um, he asked for my introduction, but I saw the mail quite late, so I'm a research scholar at Bob's laboratory, and I'm doing this project as part of uh, a semester project um, advised by Martin Yagi here from MLO, and uh, as part of my research uh, scholar project, so it's done in collaboration with Martin Yagi and Bob West, so let's give them some credit. Um, and so let's start because I don't want to lay, waste any time. So before the introduction of word 2 vec and GLUF, words were treated as atomic units. And the issue with this approach is that the model uh, actually considers dock and puppy as similar as dock in an airplane, which certainly is not the case. And no, what word 2 vec and GLUF actually aim to do is learn uh, similar vector representations of words uh, that for words that are close to each other semantically. So if we consider this toy example, which is learned from word to vec uh, we see on this plot uh, 300 dimensional word representations projected in two-dimensional space. And as we can see, words like educational and education here, which are close semantically, are close to each other in the embedded space. And words like school, college, university are again close to each other in the space. So all in all, this approach gave a huge boost to most of the NLP tasks, but it certainly has some limitations. And those limitations lie in uh, its monolinguality. If you consider this space as embeddings, again, in the same scenario, where you have learned uh, word embeddings for German, in a 300 dimensional space, project them, totally the same thing. But again, we get word representations which are comparable geometrically between each other. But if we look at them cross lingually, these two embedding spaces are totally different. And we can't compare words based on their embeddings between German and English language. So ideally, we'd like something like this. What's the difference here? In this embedding space, the semantic uh, similarity is captured across languages. So on one side, we have people, population, children, world, close to each other it's in English. And on the other side, we have kinder, close to children, welt, close to world, as an example. And those happen to be direct translations of each other. Sorry for the, for the pronunciation for any German-speaking people here. So having an embedding like this would make a lot, a lot more sense for uh, cross-lingual tasks, and it could open a lot of possibilities. For example, imagine writing a query in English and retrieving the most relevant results in any language there is. All in all, this is all a great idea, but it has some challenges. In order to get an embedding space like this, you need to have some cross-lingual signal. And because we're doing machine learning, that signal needs to come in some kind of an aligned data. Recently proposed, uh, proposed approaches for dealing with this usually take advantage of word-aligned data, which is technically a dictionary of words, or sentence-aligned data, which is both of which are expensive, and that cost is reflected in the amount of available data. Another challenge is scalability. While increasing the number of uh, languages that you want to embed in the same space, the amount of data needed in training rises proportionally. So the training method sh should scale reasonably good as the uh, amount of data increases. So how do we do it? First, let's start with the data. We are making, uh, we're making use of uh, Wikipedia's uh, as a knowledge base for three simple reasons. First, we have huge amount of data. Second, almost every concept that is available in Wikipedia is available in more than one language. 
And third, Wikipedia offers a really simple way of retrieving the concepts by mapping each article with a unique ID that represents the concepts it is described in the given article, which makes the data alignment on document level really easy. Here you can see an example of the concept Apple being described in English and French. Cool, now we have the data. What next? We process each document using the bag of words model. So for simplicity, let's look at the example. Assuming that this is our document, we first uh, take the words from it and the vocabulary in the language that the document is written in. And for each word in the vocabulary, we note how, how much times uh, the given word occurs in the text. So we have, in this given example, the word tree appears only once, animal does not occur at all, and apple occurs twice. We do this for all of the documents in our data set. Now, now that we have the bag of words representations for all the documents, we do the following. Let's first take a look at this matrix here. We stack all the documents vertically, and we stack all the vocabularies um, horizontally. And in this example, I have two concepts, apple and emmental cheese, and each concept is available in the three languages. As you can see, the first two rows correspond to the English documents and only make use of the English vo vocabulary. The second two documents correspond to the French um, articles describing the same concepts and make use of the French vocabulary. And at the end, we have the German uh, counterpart for the two concepts, and they make use of the German vocabulary only. The, mar the matrix on the right is a bit more simple. And what it does, it has one row for each article, and it represents uh, the concept that is described in the given article as a one-hot uh, encoding. So as this example goes, we have once in the column representing apple for all the documents that describe the concept apple, and we have emmental cheese for all the concepts that represent the concept M and Telchis. Now that we have seen what these matrices represent, we model the problem as a rank reduced multi class classification. As the data implies, we try to map every article to the concept that the given article is describing. Later on, we use SVD on the decomposition, uh, SVD decomposition on the classifier itself to get some very interesting results, which can be best explained through an example. So let's say that we have trained our classifier, and this is its SVD decomposition. Let's assume that A English, A French, is the Apple article for French and English. Now, if this classifier does its job as it should, this the output of both products should be the same. And it should represent the rows there that correspond to those articles, which are the same because we are trying to model the same concept. Now, if we take the SVD decomposition and plug it instead of W, regroup the whole thing, we can observe something very interesting. V is orthogonal, S is diagonal. So for both of these equations to be the same, you transpose A and you transpose A for both equations should be the same, which would mean that the projections of the may, uh, done by you need to map somewhere in the same space in the R-dimensional latent space or at least close to each other for the classification to work. That would mean that U would map from, from the space of um, language-specific feature space to a language in different feature space. Since we're, uh, the U matrix operates on top of the bag of words representation, furthermore, uh, the rows of U can be um, interpreted as R-dimensional 
language in different word representations. What are the advantages of using this approach? Using a bit of mathematical manipulations, which I don't have time to get into now, this uh, objective function can be taken down to a point where it's solved uh, by using only linear algebra routines, so no gradient descent is used, or some other approaches, which makes all the training very effective. The same reason makes the thing very scal scalable. So we're able to train on 300,000 words vocabulary in total, and 1.5 million documents in four hours. That's by using only one machine. But the linear al algebra manipulation that I mentioned allow even further um, parallelization for, and they can work for each language on separate machine. And that would make the best scalability ever. Another point that I mentioned earlier on as a challenge, we only make use of document aligned data. We don't need expensive alignment, which is word level, dictionaries, or sentence level. Now let me show you some results, but first, how do we calculate the results? We, do the, we evaluate this framework on cross um, language document retrieval task. That means that we select a source language and a concept that is available in both the source language and the target language. We use the source, uh, the, the article describing the concept C in the source language as query, and the other one as target. We get a search space in the target language, which contains the target document. We calculate similarity from the query to all of the documents in the search space, and we rank them in decreasing order. Finally, we note the position of the target document in this similarity calculation, and ideally we would like to see that the target document is the document most similar to the one that we are querying with. In our framework, we use cosine similarity as a measure of similarity and as a de facto standard for information retrieval to get a one number summary of the performance of the framework, we are using harmonic mean of the rankings, as I mentioned. The results that you're about to see are done on 1,000 documents validation set, and the search space is 200,000 documents. As a baseline, we use the embed word embeddings generated by the current state-of-the-art multilingual embeddings. I've chosen two pairs of languages. This is English-Spanish as languages containing high number of resources. Here, on the x-axis, you see what's the ranking achieved when we tried the retrieval with a given query, and this is how many times was that rank achieved. Ideally, we would like to start very high, which would mean that the, most of the time, we have the target document in the first few positions. And we should see a sharp decline that would mean that as, the, as we see queries further on in the sorted documents by similarity, the, their frequency decreases. So this is our approach results, and this is the baseline. As you can see, we start a bit higher than them, and we decline a bit faster, and those are the numbers that would summarize it all. We have an average of 1.6 and 1.7 in different directions, and we achieve this with only 35 minutes of training time, while they have 2.5 and 2.38, which is not a very big, big difference, but the training time is dramatically slower. Um, hour is slower. And another example, which is an experiment done in two languages which <coughs> have low, very low overlap, which is Vietnamese and Danish. And if you can see here, we start at 100 here, and they are in the scale of 10. So although the shapes are similar, we have a much better result here. And as the averages show, we're significantly better. And what's surprising even is that the training time for this is less than 30 seconds, which is quite impressive.
Thank you. Any questions? Because everyone is already waiting for uh, wine and apparel, uh, I will throw out like one question, and then we're gonna do more. Um, if I understand well, you're, what you're doing here is just to do with words. It's not to do with grammar. Yes. Since we're using the bag of words representation, grammar is an order as well is totally ignored. And is there a way you could add grammar to this and model it, which might not be language independent, but it could add a signal that you could use? Of course. I think that there is a way, but uh, it will certainly increase the number of um, the time needed in training first, and that's especially the reason why more expensive data is needed, because in order to capture the grammar, you need to have a certain order, and the translation should be correct, and word to word or sentence to sentence. It's more expensive in one sense.